continues next on AM560, The Answer. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Michelle Wu is the mayor of Boston by way of Barrington High School. But uh, she went from Barrington High School to Harvard. And uh, now as mayor of Boston, she's applying what she learned at Harvard, like neo-segregation. This uh, story that made news last week about a holiday party for elected officials of color only. Electeds of color. And it, the invite was accidentally sent to a honky who raised the issue of an electeds of color only Christmas party. And the controversy ensued last week. Michelle Wu defending the uh, segregated holiday party. I think we've we've had individual conversations with everyone so people understand that it was truly just a, an honest mistake that went out in, in typing the email field and um, I look forward to celebrating with everyone at the holiday parties that we will have besides this one as well. So um, it is my intention that we can again um, be a city that lives our values and create space for all kinds of communities to come together. <laughs> She sounds like Brandon Johnson. Like that's the kind of lingo but, you learn. Yeah. That's the kind of lingo you learn at Harvard. Uh, she's, They're all the she's, same. Yeah, she's riffing right off of Claudine Gay from uh, her uh, house testimony. This little thing. She's just mad she got caught. See, she made the mistake of sending it to seven white members on the council, and that's how that yeah. happened. But it reminds very she, reminiscent she, of Mayor Lightfoot when she said, you know, after her first year in office, she would only talk to black reporters. She didn't get caught. So she's not apologizing or anything. She's explaining it was a process here. It shouldn't have gone to those honkies, yeah. but otherwise it's fine. And I know the story goes that this has been going on for some time because, of course, the uh, the, the the guilt ridden Irish honkies that preceded Michelle Wu are just as bad of identitarian hacks as she is. By the way, Michelle Wu is married to a doughy, pasty, I'm sure, eunuch who's also a honky. But whatever. So I can't guess he can't attend uh, the Christmas party with his wife, at least that one. So there's the the Christmas party for the electeds of color. And then there's other holiday parties that where honkies are allowed to come. And uh, um, so that's that's really nice. Um, by the way, just so you get Michelle Wu's perspective, in case you think this is a one off and she's just trying to continue the uh, protocols that she inherited. This was uh, her uh last spring at a saint patrick's day event in just over 100 days we have connected unhoused residents at mass and cast to housing treatment and services we've launched three free bus lines we've taken some big bold actions but i won't lie this past winter was pretty intense trial by snow trial by fire fighters union i'm getting used to dealing with problems that are expensive disruptive and white I'm talking about snowflakes. Snowflakes. I mean snowstorm snowflakes. Isn't she funny? Disgrace. Uh, Eli Steele, our friend, a documentarian, uh, How Jack Became Black, as well as uh, along with his father, Shelby, What Killed Michael Brown, both good documentaries if you haven't seen them. He uh, wrote about Claudine Gay last week and uh, Michelle Wu as well. When I learned that Boston Mayor Michelle Wu hosted a racially segregated holiday party, I wondered, would I have been invited? After all, my father is black, but my skin looks white. The No Whites Gathering was exposed this week for uh, after a city employee accidentally emailed invitations to a Caucasian council member. If I had received an invite by mistake or not, I would have headed over to Mayor Wu's office for an explanation. My mother is Jewish, my paternal grandmother was white, but my paternal grandfather was black and had Native American in, uh, ancestry. Would I be allowed in the doors? I've treaded these racialized waters before, so I can imagine the mayor, when confronted with my complex identity, would have replied, oh, of course, you're one of the electeds of color, though her answer would be meaningless. Neither my complexion nor my race reveal anything substantial about me or my character. Throughout the year, we work to boost, uh, we work to represent our communities with urgency and determination, Mayor Wu boasted on Instagram while posing a, with, uh, a, posing in a picture of the electeds of color. 
Uh, you're wrong, Mayor Wu. This is not something to celebrate. Um, Mayor Wu is a racist. And she is. But that's what all the identitarians are. And so, um, you know, again, the Harvard graduates of the world, uh, the, the Harvard graduates go off into the world and then they do things like Mayor Wu uh, overseeing the city of Boston. For more on all of this, we're pleased to be joined by Jason Hill, professor of philosophy at DePaul University, author of What Do White Americans Owe Black People? Racial Justice in the Age of Post-Oppression. And you can subscribe to Jason's Substack. Moral Inoculation is the name of Jason Hill's Substack. Jason, thanks for joining us as usual. Appreciate it. Good morning, Dan and Amy. Thank you for having me. How, how did you react to um, you know last week's uh, race controversy du jour and uh, particularly our friend, our mutual friend, Eli Steele's response? Well, I think Eli's response is very, very apt. Um, I know Eli, and I think that, um, you know, it's it's not surprising. I've been warning myself, and I think Amy Wax years ago called for the defunding of universities. I think I went a little bit further, but I, st I, I would think I was the first one that identified them as national security threats <clears throat> and breeding ground for enemies of enemies of the state. And Dan and Amy, I think if we really, really want to see the practical outcomes of both critical race theory, but especially critical race theory, and these DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusive inclusion initiatives applied in real life, um, we're seeing them right now because this kind of anti-white racism that the mayor herself is practicing as a person of color herself um, the chickens have come home to roost. This is CRT, critical race theory, combined with these DI initiatives writ large, right? And it's and it's what's really interesting is that when critical race theory was first, um, when it came on the scene in the 1970s, but when it first reared its ugly head in its third iteration a couple of years ago, it really wasn't mainstream, right? People were sort of like really horrified and that it was saying all these horrible things. But no, this kind of anti-white racism has become completely mainstream, has com become completely normalized. And we see the ugly side of the DEI policies, the inclusivity part, where inclusivity really, really means um, inclusion, um, inclusion of everyone besides white people. Um, so I, I think that I was really, really, I hate to say it, but I was really correct that um, the universities have become indoctrination, are still indoctrination centers. They are breeding enemies of the state. Um, we see the radical pro Hamas and pro Palestinian uh, students who are Gen Zers mostly marching through our cities, marching through Chicago, and New York, um, in favor of terrorists. And these are the ventriloquists of the professoriate in our universities. And so, um, what, what do you think? Where, where do you think we are right now? Because, of course, there's a lot of uh, of meaning being attached to the termination of Liz McGill as president of Penn, um, as and then the flip side, of course, is Claudine Gay surviving as the president of Harvard. It, it was the McGill firing. Is that just a moment? But there's no real movement to qualitatively change the culture on college campuses. Or, or is this the beginning of a movement, perhaps? Well, you know, Dan and Amy, I really am of two minds here because the more <clears throat> I've been in, in academia for, for over 26 years, a professor for over 26 years, so I see a sort of entrenchment of the, the rot and the detritus and the putrefaction. I can smell it from where I am. Um, so I'm of two minds. One makes me think that it's, it's the rot is so embedded in the DNA that nothing is going to change. But I tell you what gives me hope. I think it's, there's no defunding that's really going to happen, at least not on, under this administration. But it does put alumni and donors, just regular, even $10 to $100 donors, um, it does put them on notice. It does make them realize for the first time what's really taking place in our universities. And when you saw the retraction of that $100 million donation, um, from, from, from University of Pennsylvania, uh, I think this is going to terrify a lot of universities to hold themselves accountable. And it's going to put the boards of trustee and its members um, 
it's going to make them become more like sentinels and watchdogs. So I think we could, I, my hopeful side thinks that we're starting to see the beginning of something called accountability in these universities. Because all you have to really do is follow the money. And when donors begin to retract their dollars because of this kind of, I'm just going to use the word, it's evil. There's nothing, it's nothing, I think we have to re- recover a word that Augustine really shaped and formed beautifully. Uh, when you see this kind of evil taking place on campuses and donors begin to re- retract their donations, um, then I think this is the beginning of a moral reactionary moment in U.S. history in terms of education. But it's not going to come from the government. What's the, what's mean, the, dis- what's the, what, what's the distribution of power on campus, generally speaking? I mean, from your own experience as well as your own, your understanding of of college campuses um, writ large. And I ask because there's a great story out in uh, College Fix, I think, uh, in the last couple of days. Northwestern, my alma mater, uh, it's in the news, so that means the value of my degree will be declining oh, again. Uh, and the uh, news out of Northwestern is Northwestern has two, admi- excuse me, uh, one administrator for every two undergrads. One administrator yeah. for every two undergrads. So my question is, what's the balance of power on campus? Is it with the administrative staff or the professorate? You know, what what does that look like in terms of, let's understand exactly what we're dealing with if you want to uh, dig out the rot in, uh, that you describe on campus. If you want to dig out the rot, don't look for the professoriate. Look for the bloated totalitarian bureaucracy look for the first well the 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 provost the associate deans the executive deans the associate executive deans the associate provosts um that is a blow to totalitarian bureaucracy um because very often i can tell you that um lines that come open that is um let's say in an anthropology department sometimes will be dictated by a provost who will say, you need to hire um, a, a female anthropologist or a female philosopher specializing in decolonialism. And the department may not specifically have a need for such a person, but there's an agenda in the university. The, gen- the, the university has a DIE quota to fill, and the department really has no need for that person, but the, the, the bloated administrative um, personnel um, it might be the provost. It could be. It could be coming from the dean of the college. Uh, has an agenda, and the agenda is to trans the university a little bit more, make it more trans friendly, or to have more, um, uh, make it more LGBT um, friendly, or to have it just be more inclusive or diversified. Where we're not talking about diversity of thought. Um, we're talking about making it more uh, Marxist oriented. So don't the, the professoriate are the and the students are ventriloquists and the professoriate are the sort of um, the purists who do the dirty work of indoctrinating the students. But in terms of the real power structure, that we're talking about administrators, we're talking about provosts and deans and associate deans who are paid enormous salaries, who actually are responsible for the exorbitant fees, partially responsible for the exorbitant fees that students are charged. Um, we're talking about hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars that deans and provosts are paid. And then the minions, the associate provosts, and then the executive provosts, and, and every dean, associate dean has an assistant working on it, him or her. Uh, so that's the distribution of power as I've seen it uh, on campuses. Well, what do you think? Don't you think parents should have a say in this too? I mean especially when they're coming home, you know, for Christmas break now or for the holidays, that they should talk to their kids, like, what is going on at your campus? Well, Amy, I think now parents are having a say. I think before, right, I used to get calls from parents, and the calls were, you know, these were far, far and few in between. The calls were really, um, Professor Hill, you know, respectfully, how come – Jimmy didn't get an in the class because the parents, like the students, were really great grubbers, right? Because these resumes were being written, their children's resumes were being written in utero, um, and they were highly um, overly scheduled children. So from the parents pregnant, the, the, the resumes were being written for the children to get into Harvard, 
<laughs> they didn't get into Harvard, they got into DePaul. Um, so now, but now with all this <laughs> critical race theory and all the mayhem that's taking place, parents are taking advantage. Why? Because, because as I like to say, um, the diploma that you get, I, I, I used to tell my students, the difference between yourself and the kids at Harvard is that the kids at Harvard have better connections on the ski slopes. Um, but qualitatively, they're not that smarter than you are. They just have better connections than you do. And your diploma is now qualifying you to be a floor manager at Walmart or Walgreens. Um, and this is coming home to parents who are paying $40,000 a year or $50,000 or whatever they pay at other universities. I know at DePaul they pay about thirty eight to $40,000. And realizing that they're in debt for a college diploma that qualifies their student, their, their children, for nothing more than middle management, right? So I think, no, we're going to, by the way, I think what should happen is that universities should be sued, right? Uh, there should be more lawsuits, and we are going to see more lawsuits coming forward. Um, and that's going to also have universities be held accountable. Um, and also, another thing, Dan and Amy, that I think is going to help the situation is that we're going to see the the closing down of useless departments like gender studies, like queer studies, um, like black and African diaspora studies. These, these are programs. These are just, these are not legitimate fields of inquiry. I'll get in trouble for saying that. Who cares? I'm in trouble already. I've always been in trouble since I was a <laughs> graduate student. You, you think that, wait, you think, you think they're really going to get shut down? I mean, that won't go, that won't happen without incident. Well, I think as fewer people major in these useless programs and realize that there are no jobs for these diplomas mm. and that fewer and fewer people can take these studies. There, there was a time when people would major in these disciplines for self and excuse me, self enrichment purposes or for self enhancement, what they would call, I hate this word, uh, self actualization uh, reasons that they no longer have. You, you no longer have the luxury of doing that when you're paying forty thousand or fifty or sixty thousand dollars for that type of degree. Condoleezza Rice did that at Stanford. I've done a lot of research on this woman. She did that at Stanford. One of the first things she did as provost was she shut down like ethnic. Well, it was reopened after she 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 went on to become national security advisor. But she shut down a lot of these ethnic studies and gender studies, or she morphed them. Um, so I think. From a fiscal point of view, I think that is going to happen at a lot of universities because, I mean, you see it happening in modern languages where fewer and fewer people are majoring in uh, Portuguese and, and German and so on, and these, these, these programs. Mm. Um, much uh, well, that, some that's, something we'll, that's something we'll watch. Uh, Professor Jason Hill, professor of philosophy at DePaul, author of What Do White Americans Owe Black People? Racial Justice in the Age of Post-Oppression. You can subscribe to Professor Hill's Substack. It's entitled Moral Inoculation. Moral Inoculation, Inoculation is Jason Hill's Substack. Professor Jason Hill, thank you as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. The Answer. Signature Bank is Chicago's fastest growing independently owned business bank. It's a bank where relationships still matter. I'm Dan Proft, and I know this because Signature Bank is my business bank. And this is Brian Duncan, co-founder of Signature Bank. We wish you the very best this holiday season from Signature Bank, Chicago's business bank. Signature Bank helps local businesses succeed. Let Signature Bank turn your business vision into reality this holiday season. Visit SignatureBank.Bank. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. This is a special alert to all Americans who own a vehicle with less than 200,000 miles with an auto warranty about to expire or with no warranty coverage at all. Due to a decline in the economy, CarShield is announcing a low-cost, month-to-month vehicle protection plan that is now available to the public to save any driver out-of-pocket expenses on future auto repairs. Call now to find out how you can pay almost nothing for covered auto repairs. Yes, you heard that correctly. Pay almost nothing for covered auto repairs. An open phone line has been established for all drivers to call for a free quick quote. Call 800-353-2973 now. Drivers who are covered will not have to pay for covered repairs again. This protection plan is at an all-time low. Additionally, drivers who activate this vehicle protection today will also receive free roadside assistance, free towing, and coverage.